Good morning. If you have your Bibles with you, and I sure hope you do, would you open them up with me to Luke chapter one? We're gonna be in verses 39 through 56 this morning as we look at Elizabeth's encouragement and Mary's magnificent. I wanna start um, by trying to set the stage for what we're about to see happen through um, Elizabeth and through Mary in this passage of scripture um, by sharing with you about two of the deepest griefs that I've experienced in life and then two of the greatest joys. Uh, the two, some, two of the deepest griefs that I've experienced in life alongside my wife would be that of uh, a long years, years, years worth season of infertility where we longed for a child and yet as much as we longed, that prayer went unanswered. And then the second one would be uh, after a miscarriage, after we uh, lost our son in the womb. Those are the deepest griefs. I don't wanna stay there too long. Two of the greatest joys have been the births of our two daughters. And the reason I say that I wanna start with talking about the, some of the deepest griefs that I've experienced and holding that up alongside two of the deepest joys is because I believe that for us, the depth of joy that we experienced from the, the innermost parts of our being uh, for receiving the gifts of Lila and of Clara were magnified when they were held up against, because they were held up against two of the greatest griefs that we've ever experienced. And what we're about to see through Elizabeth's encouragement and Mary's magnificent is a depth of rejoicing that comes from these two amazing women, I believe primarily because they also understand the depth of the grief of their own sin and their own need for the savior that had been provided for them. And so this morning, our subject as we look at this passage is rejoicing in God, our Savior. It's the first recorded responses to the incarnation that we sing, that we see. And what we will see from Mary is that her rejoicing is expressed through song. And it's a song that comes from the depths of her soul and her spirit. That would be to say the deepest parts of who she is, is rejoicing because of who the Lord is and what he has done for her. In my opinion, in this passage, verse 46 is the key verse, and it says this. And Mary said, my soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. As we get further into the sermon, I'll unpack that for you, but essentially what she's saying is my soul is lifting up itself to see God for all that he is. And my spirit is rejoicing because he chose by his grace to provide a savior for me. And what we will see in her song also for you. And here's why this is important for us to study this morning. Mary's joy is not manufactured. She's not just putting on some show so the congregation will see her waving her hands around. Mary's joy is deep and it's real because she is seeing God rightly in all of his glory and beauty for who he is and because she is personally experiencing that joy for herself and it's expressed through song. True Christianity doesn't stop at doctrine and morality. True Christianity erupts in praise from the innermost parts of the soul. Um, I was having, Lindsay and I were having lunch with some friends last Sunday and uh, after services and I was telling them how one of the things that I, I do for multiple reasons is I like to watch people sing. So don't be creeped out by that. <laughs> I like to watch people sing because seeing others rejoice in who God is is a means that God uses to strengthen my own faith. And then it also, at a, a superficial level, serves as somewhat of a litmus test for understanding where different individuals may be in their embracing and abiding with Jesus as Savior. 
But it doesn't really matter when I look at you when you're singing what I may see. What matters is what is happening in your soul and your spirit when you sing. A right understanding of who God is and what he's provided for us through Jesus Christ will be cultivating deep within you a joy that is expressed from your soul as you sing. And if that joy is not there when you sing, it's, a, it's an indicator like the light on the dashboard of your vehicle that something is not as it should be. And so one of the gifts that God has given us is that he has recorded Elizabeth's encouragement and Mary's magnificent, her song of praise, so that we can be reminded again of who God is and what he has done, that our joy deep within us may be kindled afresh, that we may see God more rightly and love him more deeply, and then we would express not, not, that not just in how we sing on a Sunday, but how our life sings as we walk with him throughout the week. And so this morning, we're gonna walk through this passage in three different sections. We're gonna look at three things that God did for Elizabeth, four things that God did for Mary, and four things that God will do for all who fear them. So if you add up those minutes for each of those points, we're gonna be moving fairly quickly through this, but it's all driving home towards the point of what a right view of God um, and a personal relationship with him should cultivate within our lives. And so let me pray and we'll dive into studying this. Father, we um, are so grateful that you are a God of grace. We're so thankful, God, that through Elizabeth and through Mary, that you have preserved for us a, a recorded praise magnifying who you are and what you've done for all who fear you. So this morning, Father, we ask that through Elizabeth and through Mary, you would allow us to see you and it would be beautiful in our hearts that it would, you would um, help us to love you more deeply and that songs that we sing would be sincere expressions of joy that you have put within us. We ask these things in the name of Christ, amen. Well, let's start to look at the first section of what the three things that God did for Elizabeth. It's in verses 39 through 45. I'm gonna read this passage, this part of the passage, and I'm gonna draw out these three things. It's probably not the only three things, but these are three things that I wanna draw attention to this morning. It says this. Now at this time, Mary arose and went in a hurry to the hill country to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. Bless you. And so the first thing that God did for Elizabeth is this. God allowed Elizabeth to learn through her unborn child that the Messiah had come. Let me set the stage for where that comes from. Just earlier uh, in this passage, Two weeks ago when Jason was teaching us on the birth of John foretold, he walked us through what Gabriel communicated to Zacharias whenever the announcement um, of the birth of John was given. And, and this is what it says. I'm gonna flip back to Luke chapter one, verses 15 through 17. It says this, for he, John the Baptist, that Elizabeth would bear, will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. He will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. And it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And so here's what happens. Mary 
goes on this journey after she heard her own good news of a miraculous conception, comes into the house of Zacharias and Elizabeth, and the very first thing that happens is John the Baptist in the womb of Elizabeth leaps for joy. And what that's communicating is a, is a few different things. It's a fulfillment of what God had promised that the child in Elizabeth's womb would be filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's also a fulfillment of that John the Baptist is stepping into as a child in the womb, the office of prophet, of forerunner for Jesus that God had given to him. And what we see, the ve- who's the very first person that John the Baptist prepares to receive Jesus Christ as the Messiah who had come? His mom. Can you imagine? Elizabeth had probably heard this from Zacharias through him writing in the dirt or something because he was under the Lord's discipline and couldn't speak. But she hears like this is who this child is gonna be that she's conceived and then the Messiah comes in the room, in the womb of Mary and her child leaps. And she knows that what God had promised is true, that she is carrying the forerunner of the Messiah and the first person that he goes to turn the heart to receive the Messiah is Elizabeth. What a gift of kindness from God to Elizabeth. And we see a picture of God's kindness and his grace towards Elizabeth. So he allowed Elizabeth to learn through her unborn child that the Messiah had come. The second thing that God gives Elizabeth is a sweet sisterhood of faith with Mary. You gotta remember that both of these women were in places in their life where it would be impossible from a um, human standpoint for them to bear a child. One was barren, the other one was betrothed but was yet a virgin and yet both of them have these miraculous conceptions. And it would be something where, especially for Mary, where no one would probably, no one would believe her that she says, oh, I, I, I didn't have an affair on Joseph. The Holy Spirit came upon me and I conceived of the God man. Like no one would have believed her and both of them would have been in these spots where it would have been hard for people to relate what they were going through. But God in his kindness ordained by his providence that he would have both of these miraculous conceptions come upon women who are of the same family, they're cousins with each other, they would have already had a deep relational bond and they come together and what we see play out through this passage is this incredible, incredible picture of comfort, of strength, of encouragement and of rejoicing together in what God had done for them. And you see this beautiful picture of a sisterhood of the faith that exists. And it's a picture for what all of us should be seeking for is a sisterhood and a brotherhood of the faith in which we strengthen each other and rejoice together in what God is doing for our lives. And so we see God's kindness towards Elizabeth in what he provided for her in her relationship with Mary. And then thirdly, God gave Elizabeth a savior. Notice what she says in verse 43. Elizabeth says, how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? And so we see Elizabeth rejoicing in God, her savior, and acknowledging that the life of the God man in Mary's womb is indeed the Messiah who had been promised to come for thousands of years. And that that one who Mary cared would be the very one who would die and make a way of salvation for Elizabeth. And so we see her rejoice. She's rejoicing in who God is and what he's done for her. And so through Elizabeth, we learn about God, that he's kind, that he's good, and that he is gracious. And so that's what God did for Elizabeth. The next thing that we're gonna see as we go through this passage is four things that God did for Mary. And so let's take a look at those four things. The first one is this. God gives Mary blessedness. 
When y'all read the word blessed, do you say blessed or blessed? Just curious. Yeah, I gotta go back and forth in my mind. But God gives Mary blessedness. And let me show you where that comes from. Elizabeth, Elizabeth declares about Mary what God had done for Mary. And so Elizabeth calls Mary blessed for two reasons. The first reason, she says in verse 42, blessed are you among, not above all women, but among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. So she's essentially saying, you're blessed because God has given you the uh, once in a humanity gift of being the mother of God, of being the mother of the Messiah. And then the second reason that she declares that Mary is blessed is because of her faith. That's what she says in verse 45. Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. Now, it's interesting. She says, blessed are you because you believe. Mary had come to Zacharias and Elizabeth's house probably was not a mansion, but like a little abode that they were living in. And so it's likely that when Mary came in, Zacharias was sitting on the other side of the room, unable to speak because he didn't believe. And, and Elizabeth, her, uh, his wife declares, Mary, you're blessed because you believed. You think maybe she's taking a shot at old Zacharias over there who's been mute for six months at this point, you know? And uh, probably not, but it's fun to think about. But she says, blessed are you because you believed. And she's showing, she's pointing to Mary's faith that has come about in the actions of her life. Mary's response to the announcement of the miraculous conceptions was one of faith that led her to respond in action. Let me take you back to verses 39 and 40 and, and show the extent of Mary's faith in God and rejoicing in him. This passage started by saying, now at this time, Mary arose and went in a hurry to the hill country, to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. You and I read that, we go by it very quickly. When it says now at this time, what it's referring to is after the angel Gabriel visited Mary, declared to her, announced to her that she would be conceived of the spirit, that she would carry in her womb and give birth to the Messiah and also that her cousin Elizabeth, who was barren, was with child. At that time, she believed and she went to her cousin's house. We read that and we're like, okay, that's great. Do you know where her cousin's house was? It wasn't just down the street. What we see happening in that one little verse, because of Mary's belief in God and her desire to celebrate God with her cousin, is she goes on a 90 mile journey as a teenager, uphill, likely walking, so it would have taken her about 10 days to get there, all to go celebrate and rejoice in God together with the one other woman who had received a miraculous conception. Why did she do all that? Because she believed God. And what he had done, not only in her own miraculous conception, but in the miraculous conception of her cousin Elizabeth and also in what God would do through both of their children. It's a beautiful picture and it's a blessed, Mary's blessed because of those reasons. But here's the big question that comes out of that. What does it mean to be blessed? Are we blessed with the best? Which means that we're like receiving all of these material uh, wealth and possessions in our life? No, it does not. The very child that's in Mary's womb at this point, Jesus, would go on in, I think what is his longest recorded sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, starting with a section called the Beatitudes. And in the Beatitudes, Jesus himself begins to describe what is true blessedness. What does it truly mean to be blessed? And the first things that he start with is Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And he goes on to outline these other things that make a person blessed. And what it's describing, what Jesus himself describes blessedness as, is not something that relates to our external circumstances, but rather that's something that relates to 
our inner spiritual well-being. And so Mary, God gives her blessedness and Elizabeth declares her to be blessed, not because of her external circumstances, but because of her inner spiritual state, because of her faith and the joy that resides deep within her soul because of what God had done. And so blessedness is a spiritual state of well-being. It's a deep, joy-filled commitment that can't be shaken by poverty, grief, trial, or tragedy. And so therefore, when Mary says in verse 46, my soul exalts or magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior, all she's doing is is exclaiming verbally that which is true of her inwardly. And so what she's about to go on and describe here are the things that she is, the, the reasons and the ways that she is blessed internally and celebrating those publicly externally as she sings her song. And so God had given her a blessedness. But then it says, and Mary said, my soul exalts the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my savior. For he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name. So she rejoices in God and outwardly expresses her inner blessedness. When she says, my soul exalts the Lord, what does that mean? We don't use the the term exalt very much. Your translation may say, my soul magnifies the Lord. But there's two ways to think about magnification, and it's important that we understand it rightly for what Mary does and what we should be doing continually. Uh, One is to think about magnification in terms of a microscope, and the other way is to think about magnification in terms of a telescope. So what do you use a microscope for? You use a microscope to make something that's really small appear a lot bigger than it actually is. But then what do you use a telescope for? You use a telescope to take something that is enormously large and bring it closer for greater inspection of it. And when Mary talks about how her soul exalts the Lord, she is talking about taking that which is the most majestic and grand of all, God himself, and bringing him into closer view through what she declares so that she can enjoy and celebrate him more. And so she is lifting up her soul to see God more clearly and more fully than she ever has before. And as she does that, there's a natural byproduct when she says then, my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. And her spirit rejoices because she is seeing God more clearly than she ever has before. And here's something else that's important to note is that through this, Mary rejoiced because her knowledge of God as savior wasn't simply theological, it was personal. Mary rejoiced because her knowledge of God was personal, which brings us to the second thing that God gave Mary, that God did for Mary. God saved Mary through the child she carried. Think of that. God saved Mary through the child she carried. She says, my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. So Mary got to nurture the very one who would save her from the penalty of her sins. And it's a unique gift that she got to cherish and ponder in her heart all the days of his life as she raised him. Then the third thing that God did for Mary is just the broad statement that she makes, God did great things for Mary. What could those great things be? Well, first, just think of it this way. God chose Mary to be the mother of God. What would that be like? Mary fully believing that this child that she had just been conceived of through the Holy Spirit, she now has this unique bond with that would be distinctly different from anyone else in all of human history. She got to have this intimate bond that's formed between a mother and a child as she nurses Jesus 
the savior of the world through his infancy. Think about the depth of bond that would have existed between Mary and Jesus because of that. It's a unique gift that God gave specifically to her. Also think about what would it have been like for Mary to watch uh, her child be perfect. It's like every mom's dream, right? The perfect child. Mary had the perfect child. Think about how blessed she was because of that. But think about the joy that she would have watching her child navigate temptation, trial, and to do it with perfection. It's a gift. It's one of the great things that God did for Mary. He also exalted Mary from her lowly position. He said he had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. Drew did a phenomenal job of describing to us who Mary was last week, but by some way of reminder, she was just an ordinary girl that God chose to use in extraordinary ways. She would have been a a poor girl from the city of Nazareth. We learn from elsewhere in scriptures that the reputation of Nazareth was that nothing good ever comes out of Nazareth. She likely would have been illiterate, although she was clearly very educated in the scriptures because of all the Old Testament references contained in this in her song. And we see that although her position was lowly of, of being in poverty, um, of being illiterate, of being from somewhere where no one would ever know her name, her faith was incredible. As we see her cling to the character and the person and the promises of God. So ultimately, we saw God choose a teenage girl from Nazareth, where nothing good comes from, to be the mother of the Christ who would save her. And Mary's response to that is simply gratitude. She recognizes all these great things that God has done for her. And then the fourth thing that God did for Mary is that God showed Mary that there is none like him. She says at the end of this section of her song, and holy is his name. Holy is a very religious term, right? But what does it mean? Holy simply means, if we're gonna boil its definition down, to something that is set apart from everything else. And so what Mary is declaring is because God, and what she sees through the miraculous conception is his, is his sovereignty over all things, the way that he timed everything about the incarnation for the fulfillment of the prophecy, a prophecy about the coming Messiah through his grace and his mercy to bring about a gospel um, for sinners to be saved, the way that she sees his kindness and his goodness towards her specifically, the way that uh, she sees all these things, his majesty, his glory. She's just simply declaring, in light of all that I know God to be, there is absolutely no one who has ever existed that is like him. He alone is glorious. He alone is full of grace and full of truth. And so she is declaring her reverence, her awe, her fear of who God is. And God, in his grace, allowed her to see him for who he really is. And it was a gift And we see in that, that her knowledge was not just theological, but that it was personal. And so we got, we see God in this passage doing all kinds of miraculous things for both Elizabeth and for Mary. But what Mary exclaims to the rest of her song is what God will do for all who fear him, which means she is talking about what the child in her womb, who is, will be the visible image of the invisible God, will do for all who see God rightly and love him deeply by responding to faith in who he is and what he's done for us. And so let's look at the four things that Mary declares God will do for those who fear him. This is verses 50 through 55. She says, in his, God's mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. 
He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. And so the first thing that I wanna show you from this that God does towards those who fear him is that he shows them mercy. He shows them mercy. What is mercy? It's another word that we can use a lot. You think, should think of mercy as a pardon. So a pardon would be someone who is guilty of a crime, goes before a judge, is declared guilty, is given a sentence of punishment, but then either the judge or an executor above the judge steps in and declares that I am going to pardon them from the penalty of the crimes that they have committed. That would be a picture of someone being shown mercy. They do not get what they deserve for the things that they have done. And what Mary is declaring here, that to those who fear God, God will show mercy. And that's good news for you and for me. Why is that good news? Because all of us are guilty of the crime of rebellion against God. We're all guilty for sin. Therefore, we're all, we are all deserving to be eternally separated from God. But God, for those who by faith fear him and see him rightly for who he is, which means also seeing Jesus rightly for who he is and receiving him, he will extend mercy to, we will not receive the judgment that we have earned and that we deserve because of our sin. We are pardoned. And the reason that we can be pardoned is because this child in Mary's womb would take that penalty upon himself. But we are shown mercy. And this is mercy towards those who fear him. And so those who view God rightly. And so that's the first thing. The second thing that God will do towards all who fear him is give grace. Give grace. God gives grace to the humble. And so we see here Mary in this section, praises God for bringing justice and judgment to the proud while giving grace to the humble. First Peter 5.5 5 says this, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So what does this mean? As God shows mercy to those who view him rightly, God gives grace to those who view themselves rightly. And what does that mean? It means this, that Jesus didn't come to save perfect people. He came to save those who are willing to admit their imperfection. And I think it's no accident that Mary starts with the fear of God and then goes to the humble because it's only upon us seeing God rightly for who he is that we can truly understand our own depravity, our own poverty, like our own need for him. And so they go hand in hand with each other. And then Jesus describes, again, this humility uh, in the Beatitudes. I mentioned it earlier. Matthew chapter five, verses three and four. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And so what Mary's magnifying about who God is, is that God gives grace to the humble. God gives grace to those who know of their own poverty of spirit. Do you know of your own poverty of spirit? Like, are you aware that apart from God, you can do nothing? You, apart from God intervening in your life, you can do nothing to live in any consistent way the righteous and good life. And then, do you mourn over your poverty of spirit? Do you mourn over your sin? And this is where I see a lot of Christians begin to get a little shipwrecked in their faith and begin to stumble. Because oftentimes when we think about, do we mourn our sin? We'll say, of course I mourn my sin. But the real reason you mourn your sin is because of the consequences that it brings into your life the natural consequences and the way that it affects relationships, the way that it would bring about um, earthly discipline into your life. But what Jesus is referring to here is that those who mourn their sin because it grieves God. They hate sin for what it is. 
They hate sin because it, the way that it grieves the heart of God himself. And the humble person that God shows grace to is the one who not only recognizes their true condition, that they are poor in spirit, but also mourns over the fact that when they sin, it's an offense against God himself and that it grieves his heart. But Mary declares for those who have this humble approach of poverty of spirit and mourning over their sin, God will, sh- will give grace towards them. And so are you humble? Are you poor in spirit and mourning over your sin? If you are, you can take great hope in that God will show grace, unmerited favor towards you. The third thing that Mary declares that God does for all who fear him is that God satisfies the hungry. Mary praises God for satisfying those who hunger for God. And she holds this up in contrast to those who are rich with material possessions, but yet reject their need for God himself. And she essentially says, those who are rich in this present world, but deny their need for God, when it comes to eternity, they will be sent away empty handed. But those who hunger for God will be satisfied. Think about this. Jesus, again, in the Beatitudes, he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. When's the last time that you went like a long duration without food? Can you think of it? Uh, Mine was a couple of weeks ago. I was on a backcountry trip with some friends of mine and uh, we woke up at 4 a.m. and I had oatmeal and peanut butter. And then we hit the trailhead and we spent the next 13 hours hiking somewhere between seven and nine miles um, in the mountains. And the only thing that I had all day was one little granola bar. And that night for dinner, we had planned to eat uh, filet mignon steaks with baked potato, salad, sourdough bread, olive oil, and a dipping sauce. And so we were out there all day, got back to the, to the uh, base camp, completely just like starving, having fully expended ourselves. And then the steaks hit the iron and the smell, the glorious smell, <laughs> like fills my nostrils. And you know what it does? It makes me even more hungry. And after about just a few minutes, because you don't want to overcook a good steak, we began to eat. And at the end of that feast, for that moment, my hunger was fully satisfied. And one of the things that Mary is holding up and magnifying about God is that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be satisfied. And there's something true about all those who are truly in Christ. The Holy Spirit will be cultivating in your life a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, for that which is good and right and true, a hunger and a thirst to know a perfect person who will always lift you up and who will never let you down a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, that which is good and right and true to be ever more present in your own life that would be affecting your relationships in a positive way everywhere you turn. And what Mary is holding up about God is that the way that that hunger that the Holy Spirit is producing in you will be satisfied is through her child, is through Jesus Christ. You can know him, who is perfect and good, who will always lift you up and never let you down. And through knowing him, the spirit that he sends will make you more and more righteous. You will be being satisfied until you're ultimately satisfied upon your glorification. And Mary is rejoicing and celebrating in these things. And then lastly, she says that God, for all who, for all who fear God, God will keep his promises. She rejoices in God for his faithfulness to provide the Messiah, the Savior. And she is declaring to us that when God made a a promise for our salvation, 
in the same way that he was faithful to keep his promise that she would conceive the Holy Spirit and give birth to the God-man, so also we can be confident that the salvation that he came to accomplish for us has been accomplished. And we're not only forgiven, but we're raised to walk in a newness of life and that we will one day become like him and be being glorified by him for all eternity. We can take great confidence that God will keep that promise. So as we look at all these things, what we see happen is God did great things for Elizabeth and she rejoiced in him. God did great things for Mary and she rejoiced in him. A a true joy from the innermost parts of their being. So my question for you is, if you know that God has done great things for you, is your soul exalting the Lord and is your spirit rejoicing in God your savior? If you are, you are in an abiding relationship with the Lord. If you're not, something is off. And so I wanna ask you, in light of all this, can you say, and can you in earnest continually say what Mary said and insert your name? My soul exalts the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Can you say that this morning? From the depths of your being, as you were singing as service started, were you exalting the Lord from your soul and your spirit rejoicing in God your Savior? In order to move us there, I wanna give you four quick applications that we will repeat throughout our Christian life to keep our hearts in a place of rejoicing in God. And the first one is simply this, you must start by receiving Jesus as your personal savior. Mary rejoiced in God because her knowledge of God wasn't simply theological, it was personal. She knew her own sin, she knew her own need for a savior and she placed her faith in her child, Jesus, for that salvation. Have you done the same? If you desire to rejoice in God, it all starts with first receiving Jesus as your personal savior. Savior. Secondly, exalt the Lord. You personally should daily make a habit of exalting the Lord. What does that mean? Of of magnifying the Lord. Let me show you some practical ways, three practical ways about how that can play out. You can exalt the Lord for the purpose of edification, encouragement, and evangelism. Here's edification. Talk about who God is and what he has done for you to yourself. Daily be reminding yourself, not in generalities of what who God is and what he's done, but in very specific ways, who is God and what has he done for you? And make a habit of daily working through the gratitude in the same way that Mary did, the specific things about who God is and what he is doing for you, that's edification. The second one would be encouragement. Talk about who God is and what he has done for you to other believers. You better believe that when Mary and Elizabeth got together and they began sharing with each other what God had done for them, the joy that they experienced independently was multiplied when they began rejoicing together. So a very simple application for this is, when you are together with your community groups, every single time you gather, you should spend at least a few moments encouraging each other with who God is and what he is actively doing for you in your lives. And you don't have to stop at your community group. Anytime you find yourself together with other believers, encourage each other with what God is doing. And then for evangelism, it's simply this, in terms of exalting the Lord, talk about who God is and what he's done for you with those who are lost. Let them see that God is not just some theological subject to be understood, but he's a person to know. And he's a person who is active and at work in your lives and proclaim to them the majesty and the glory and the grace and the kindness of God. So exalt the Lord. Application number three, rejoice. Rejoice in God, your savior. When is the last time you would say you simply enjoyed God? Like you just 
came to him in prayer or in song or whatever it may be, simply to just enjoy him for who he is. I did that yesterday. Yesterday I was finishing up a little kayak trip down the Brazos River and there's like a two mile stretch where there's no good fishing. So I'm just paddling and I gotta do something. So what did I do? I put on Shane and Shane, Psalms volume two, and I sung really loud because no one was near me. <laughs> and uh, why did I do that? Later when Steve caught up to me, uh, he said, what you been doing? I said, I've been getting my heart ready for tomorrow morning by just enjoying being with the Lord. And I was singing simply to enjoy God. Enjoy him. Exalt the Lord and then rejoice in God, your savior, for no other reason than the fact that he's good. And it's a delight to spend time with him. And then application number four, repeat. <laughs> Do it over and over and over and over again. Because each day brings new temptations and new trials and new hardships that seek to harden our heart. And so we daily need to be reminded of Jesus, not just as the savior, but of our savior. We daily need to be reminding ourselves of the majesty of who God is. And then daily we need to be enjoying him so that our hearts are not hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And this is the Christian life as displayed through the encouragement of Elizabeth and the song of Mary, amen? We're gonna get the opportunity to hear a sister in Christ magnify the Lord and rejoice in God, her savior, as Claudia gets baptized this morning. Baptism is an outward expression of that which is inwardly true. And so she's going to be making her public profession of faith in Jesus Christ. And then as we publicly receive her as a sister through the act of baptism, we will all have a choice, a chance to celebrate together. So Claudia, welcome. Uh, hi, my name is Claudia. I grew up professing to be Catholic. I had a works-based faith. I thought that believing in God, Jesus Christ, going to church, and memorizing the traditions meant I was saved. I'm the oldest sibling, and I had a lot of responsibility from a young age. I was seen as the good kid, and I thought I had to maintain that image, so I did everything I could to please my parents and not disappoint them. It wasn't until I started high school that I started living a double life so that I could do what others around me were doing and still have the appearance of a good daughter to my family. Little did I know how living that way would shape a lot of my decisions for most of my young adult life. My parents were strict, and I thought that if I wanted to do what others were doing, I was going to have to do that stuff during school hours. I used recreational drugs during school hours initially, and then I started to test the boundaries outside of school hours. I stopped attending church when I was around 15 or 16, but still believed in God and Jesus Christ. I continued in my sin and had inappropriate relationships with guys. I began dating my future husband and I got pregnant at 19 and made the decision to have an abortion. I continued pursuing the things of this world and was unfaithful to my fiance and continued my unfaithfulness in the beginning of our marriage. After holding in that secret for three and a half years, we hit a rocky spot in our marriage and started attending Reengage, where I felt the conviction from the Holy Spirit to confess to my husband about my adultery. My confession was the act of surrendering my life to God and the first time I truly placed my faith and trust in God. I finally understood the gospel in my heart and accepted that Jesus Christ died for my sins and that I was forgiven. And from that day forward, I started to form a relationship with God by reading the Bible and spending time in prayer. I continued to attend Reengage and started attending Regeneration, which has helped me rely on God's truth, process through struggles, and live an authentic life. My husband and I attempted to reconcile our marriage, but it ultimately ended in divorce. Amidst a difficult season of my life and being without family in a new state, I prayed that God would provide me with friends. God answered that prayer better than I could have imagined. I have Christ-centered, supportive, and loving friends that I consider family. I am beyond thankful that God never stopped pursuing me, 
and I know that I have done nothing to earn eternal life with God. I still struggle with shame, but I depend on God and his word to fill my heart and mind with truth and heal me from my past. I love that I have the rest of my life to continue to get to know God more deeply and share the good news with others. Thank you for letting me share. Let me, uh, let's pray together for Claudia as we prepare to baptize, baptize her. Father, we um, are so thankful that you are a redeeming God, that you are a restoring God. And I think, I'm thankful for the way that you have allowed Claudia to see you for who you are, to know personally your grace and your mercy. And so Father, we pray for our sister that the good work that you began in her, uh, you will continue and that she will walk with you and experience the joy of the newness of life that you have provided for her. Help us as a community of faith to be a support and encouragement to her as she goes through this journey. And God, we just thank you for who you are and what you've done. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Claudia, do you acknowledge that you are indeed a sinner deserving of judgment from God? And do you recognize God's grace through his only means, provision of only means of salvation through Jesus Christ? Yes. And do you profess your faith in him and commit, empowered by the spirit, to walk in the newness of life that he has provided for you? Yes. Amen. Well, it's my joy as a brother in Christ to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism. Raised to walk in newness of life.